Good evening, everyone. I want to start by talking about the Gödel Prize. And the Gödel Prize is named after the, uh, the mathematician and computer scientist Gert, Kurt Gödel. And um, it is an annual award for outstanding papers in the field of theoretical computer science. And if we have a look at some of the winning papers of the Gödel Prize, especially in the early 2000s, and have a look what the papers are about. Well, you can see that the papers come from a very wide range of um, theoretical computer science topics. Some of you might recognize uh, Shor's algorithm for quantum computing. Um, a couple of them are about complexity theory or algorithms. And uh, uh, some of them are about logic or a computation theory. All of these papers are very interesting, but the one that really stood out for me is the 2004 paper written by uh, Professor Hurley at L for the applications of topology into the, th the theory of distributed computing. Now, even though this paper was awarded um, in 2004, this research area started way long ago in the 1980s. And I think this research area is very exciting for a couple of reasons. And the main one being that topology is one of the weirdest and most abstract branches of mathematics. And it's completely unintuitive how the mathematics and topology could be used in anywhere in computer science, let alone a rather applied area such as distributed computing. In this talk, we're going to look into one of the most exciting and fundamental results establishing this relationship between topology and distributed systems. And in particular, we'll use this result to prove one thing. We're going to show that the binary consensus problem is unsolvable in an asynchronous weight-free model. Now, if you recall what consensus is from distributed systems, it is a decision task where you have a group of nodes, each with a certain input, and you want them to communicate and agree about one of their inputs. We're considering a binary version from two different perspectives. It's binary because there are only two nodes, and it's binary because the inputs could either be zero or one. So for example, if one of the nodes are given zero, the other is given one, they can terminate with zero altogether or one altogether. But if they're given the same input, say both are given zero, they must terminate with zero altogether. We're assuming an asynchronous model, and by that I mean there's no timing guarantee in the execution time. One node might run the operations, the computation really quickly, the other might take ages, there's no lower nor upper bound in the execution time. And we're assuming a weight-free model. By that, I mean that nodes will eventually halt with the output value, regardless of crashes in other nodes. You can interpret this as fault tolerance, where each node, um, even if nodes might crash arbitrarily in the protocol, the, nodes, um, the other nodes should not be blocked and should still terminate safely. So for example, if both nodes are given number one, and the first node breaks, crashes in the middle of the protocol, the other node should still terminate safely with the number one. We're going to prove that the binary consensus problem is unsolvable using topology. But I believe some people in the audience tonight might have this burning question in your mind, and that is, we don't really need topology to prove this result, because if you recall from lecture six of distributed systems, Dr. Clapman mentioned the FLP result. And the FLP result states that consensus cannot be achieved in an asynchronous model if you might have even one node that might crash arbitrarily in the protocol. And you're absolutely right. The FLP result does establish this conclusion. But unfortunately, if you have a look at the proof in the FOP paper, the proof is very specific to the consensus problem. And if we change the decision task slightly, the entire proof will fall apart. The result from topology that we're going to look into today 
could not only be used to prove the impossibility of consensus, but it can also be used to prove the impossibility of other distributed systems tasks. So in a sense, it's more elegant and it's more powerful. Before we dive into to see what this result is about, I want to step back and look at a maths problem uh, which I encountered in primary school, which would be quite relevant. And back where I'm from, uh, Hong Kong, we have this maths problem called the Gai Tou Man Tai, which roughly translates to uh, the chicken rabbit's problem. Um, I think here in the UK or in other places, you use slightly different animals, but the general idea is the same. A chicken has uh, one head and two legs, and a rabbit has one head and four legs. And we are given that the total number of heads and feet in the farm, and we want to deduce the exact numbers of chickens and rabbits in the farm. Now, if I ask you to try and solve these classes of questions right now, the method you would use would probably be simultaneous equations or vectors or matrices. But back then in primary school, I was taught using a different method. Let's say, suppose I'm given the farm has uh, their four heads and 10 feet in the farm. What I'll do is that I'll grab a sheet of graph paper and I'll plot two lines, each, um, each of them representing uh, an equation, either the number of heads or the total number of feet. And I'll read the x and y coordinates of that intersection point of those two lines. And I can happily conclude that there are three chickens and one rabbit in the farm. Now, this is a very powerful technique because if I change the question slightly, say the farm, there are only rabbits and cows in the farm, each with one head and four legs, and suppose I know that there are four heads and 10 feet in total, I can do the same thing, can't I? I grab my sheets of graph paper, I draw the two lines, one representing the number of heads, the other representing the number of feet, and I try to find the intersection point, but I couldn't, because I just drew parallel lines, and I know that parallel lines don't have points of intersection. So I can conclude there is no solution for any number of rabbits or any number of cows that will enable me to find exactly four heads and 10 feet. So in other words, the way I prove that this problem is unsolvable in a sense is that I first draw a connection between finding a solution for the animal counts problem to finding a point of intersection on a graph paper after I draw two lines. And then I use certain mathematics that would enable me to prove that that intersection point doesn't exist. And in particular, I used um, knowledge from Euclidean geometry where parallel lines don't have points of intersection. And thus, I know that there is no solution for the second case of the animal counts problem. Now, this problem is relevant because this plan of attack is exactly the same of um, how we're going to prove the binary consensus problem is unsolvable. What we're going to do is that we're going to draw a connection between a protocol for a binary consensus problem and finding an object in some abstract model. And we're going to prove that this object in this abstract model couldn't exist. And as a result, there is no protocol specifically for the binary consensus problem. As you might have guessed, this abstract model is topology and the, the result establishing the first step, this relationship between distributed systems and topology, is a theorem called the asynchronous computability theorem. Before I proceed, I want to emphasize that in the next few slides, some of the sentences might end with an asterisk. And what that means is that I have removed some, of, some details so not to overwhelm you with too many information. But I welcome any questions asking for more clarification for some of the asterisks I put on the slides. To, to look into what the asynchronous computability theorem is about, we need to formalize what we meant by a binary consensus problem. And the way we describe a distributed system's tasks in more precise mathematics is by giving a tuple of three elements. We need to give an I, which is the set of possible inputs, O, the set of possible outputs, and delta, a relation between the inputs and the outputs, storing all the possible input-output pairs of the decision task. 
We say that the protocol could solve a decision task if given any starting inputs x in the set i, and you run the protocol, and eventually the final output is in delta x. As an example, let's have a look at what the I-O delta tuple is for the binary consensus problem. The I set is pretty simple. It contains 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, because there are only two nodes and two different inputs, so in total, four possibilities. The output set is even simpler. We only have 0, 0, and 1, 1. We don't have 0, 1, nor do we have 1, 0, because in those cases, if that is the output, consensus is not achieved. Now, let's think about what the delta relation is. And it's actually not that difficult. If the nodes are given different inputs, say 0, 1, then we can let them terminate with 0 altogether or 1 altogether. So delta 0, 1 would map to the set of 0, 0 and 1, 1. In another example, suppose if the nodes are given the same input, say in the case where both are given, the two nodes are given the number 1, does anyone want to um, um, try and guess what delta 1, 1 would map to? Yes? Exactly. It, you only have to set 1, 1, and you don't have 0, 0, because 0 is not one of the inputs for either node. Now, this is good, because we now described what we meant by a binary consensus problem more uh, formally. And if we try to think about what we, how we could describe a protocol in distributed systems in an abstract model, I think most people wouldn't come up with topology. I mean, I wouldn't. I'd probably do something like graph theory with um, nodes and edges. And it turns out that graph theory is not sufficient because it turns out we need some sort of um, dimension to represent a cluster of nodes. And this is where we need topology. And the basic objects in topology you need to know are something called simplexes and complexes. Very generally speaking, a simplex is simply a set of mutually connected vertices, meaning that every pair of nodes, every pair of vertices has an edge in between. And a complex is basically a collection of simplexes. The way I understand this intuitively is that I like to think about a 2D plane. And if I draw nodes and, 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 and edges on the, on the plane, then tr triangles or parts of a triangle would be simplexes. And complexes would be any uh, collection of simplexes you have on the plane. So as an example, if you consider this diagram, well, what are some simplexes? You, um, the simplexes you can see in this diagram would be the triangles. So say, the sets containing one, two, and three, because every pair of, ed, a pair of vertices has an edge in between. Now, parts of a triangle could also be simplexes. So for example, the set containing two and four well, that's the only pair to consider, and indeed, there's an edge in between. So 2, 4 is also simplex. In the most extreme case, the, um, the set containing one vertex, say the set containing three, is also simplex because there are no pairs to consider. The complex here could be the entire diagram, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is formed by the basic simplexes, 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 4. I want to emphasize that the entire diagram, one, two, three, four, is not a simplex because there is no edge connecting one and four. By the same reason, if you consider the set one to four, there's no edge connecting one and four, so that is also not a simplex. Now, simplexes and complexes are the basic objects you need to know in topology, but you also need to know some operations you can perform on these objects. And there are two operations you need to know. The first is something called a subdivision. Given a complex C, a complex sigma C is a subdivision of C. If every simplex in sigma C is contained in a simplex in C, and every simplex in C is the union of finitely many simplexes in sigma C. Now, this definition looks a bit intimidating, but you don't have to understand this very um, completely. The very intuitive way how you understand a subdivision is that it is simply describing the process of triangulation. You give me a complex, what I could do is that I can add more uh, vertices, I can add more, add more edges 
adding more detail in the structure, but the overall form should still be maintained. So for example, given the previous complex, I can add the notes five and six, I can add a few more edges to form more simplexes, but you can see the overall structure is the same. The second operation you need to know is something called a, sub, uh, a simplicial map. And a simplicial map from one complex to another, say complex C to D, is a function mapping vertices from C to D such that all simplexes of C are also mapped to simplexes of D. As an example, let's consider complex C as the previous subdivided complex and complex D as a really simple complex of two simplexes, AB and BC. Now one possible simplicial map might look something like this. You can see we're mapping vertices of the, of the left complex to something on the right complex. So every vertex on the left to some vertex on the right. And to see why simplexes are preserved, let's just consider one simplex on the left, one, five, three. One is mapped to A, five is mapped to A, and three to B. And the simplex one, five, three on the left is indeed mapped to the simplex AB on the right. If you do some diagram chasing, you can see that is the case for every simplex on the left. So this is a possible simplicial map. We talked about four different concepts in topology. We started off by talking about two objects, simplexes and complexes, and two operations, subdivisions and simplicial maps. And if you understand all these four concepts, you are ready to understand the asynchronous computability theorem on a very high level idea. And the high level overview of the asynchronous computability theorem is that if you give me a decision task by the tuple I, O, and delta, I can tell you that this decision task has a protocol for an asynchronous weight-free model if and only if I can find you a subdivision sigma of the in input complex and a simplicial map mu from the subdivision to the output complex, such that everything fits the delta requirements. What does this mean? What it means that if you give me a tuple I, O, and delta, I could take I and I'll interpret it as a complex, say the one on the left, and I'll take O and I'll interpret it as a complex, say the one on the right. And in order to prove that this decision task has a protocol, I need to find you two things. I need to find you that subdivision, taking the input complex to a subdivision, and a simplicial map taking that subdivision to the output complex. And if both operations fit the delta requirements, I would know there's a protocol for this decision task. What is interesting is that the theorem goes the other way around. If I know for sure there's a protocol for the decision task, I can find you the two required operations. You might ask, why is this the case? Why do these two operations neatly define a protocol? Well, a protocol has basically two stages. The first stage where nodes will exchange information and pass messages to each other. And a second stage where after exchanging information, each vertex will have to make a deterministic decision and output something. And these two stages are precisely described by these two operations. The first stage, the communication stage, is described by the subdivision. The way you think about it is that every simplex in the middle complex represents a global state that nodes could enter after exchanging information. And the second state where each node has to make a deterministic decision is represented by the simplicial map, where we're mapping every vertex from complex C, which is the one in the middle, to some vertex D, which is the output complex on the right. The thing I want to emphasize here is what it really means for a vertex to be a common vertex in two simplexes. So in the middle complex here, four is a common vertex in the simplexes two, four, six, and three, four, six. What this means is that after exchanging information, the node four 
could not distinguish whether the global state it is in belongs to the simplex 246 or the simplex 346. Regardless, 4 has, still has to make a deterministic decision and output a certain value, and in which case, 4 decides to output the character b, which is represented by the simplicial map. Now this is exciting because we have established our first step in proving the binary consensus problem is impossible. We established that finding a protocol for a decision task is exactly the same as finding two operations for complexes. Now we need to prove that these two operations could not exist. And, and the way we're going to prove it is that we have to make use of the properties of subdivision and simplicial maps. Let's just have a look at what the input and output complexes for the binary consensus problem looks like. If we represent the first person with red nodes and the second the first person is red nodes and the second person is green nodes, the input complex would look something like this. You can see there's a square and every edge represents a possible input. So for example, the top simplex here, red zero, green zero, represents the input where both nodes get zero. And the simplex red one green zero represents the possible input where the first person getting one and the second person getting zero. The output complex is even simpler. We don't have red zero green one, we don't have red one green zero because in those cases, as I said, consensus is not achieved. Now, as I said, in order to prove that a protocol exists, we need to find the two operations in order to fit the delta requirements. And now what we need to do is that we need to prove that there's no operations we could find that will fit the delta requirements. And why is that? Now let's consider an arbitrary subdivision. So let's consider a arbitrary, the first arbitrary operation. Now in order to fit the delta requirements, there are, some, there are a lot of limits to what the, what the vertices could map to. If we consider red zero, green zero, this top simplex here, that represents the state, the input, where both nodes get the number zero. And when that happens, both nodes must terminate with zero as well. And one of the, to fit the delta requirements, because red zero is part of this simplex here, red zero on the left must map to red zero on the right. This is the same case for the bottom simplex here red one, green one. This represents the input where both nodes get the number one. And if that's the case, they must terminate with one as well. Because green one is part of the simplex, to fit the delta requirements, green one on the left must map to green one on the right. And this is where the problem begins. Because one of the properties of subdivisions and simplicial maps is that they must preserve connectivity. Red zero, green one on the left started out being connected, and after the subdivision, they should still be connected, and the same after the simplicial map. But in order to fit the delta requirements, we have to map it to this connected component on the right. And because of this connectivity argument, we know there is no subdivision in simplicial map that could fit the delta requirements, and by the asynchronous computability theorem, there is no protocol for the binary consensus problem. What is interesting is that if we consider a variant of the consensus problem called the quasi-consensus problem, which is identical except in the case where both are given mixed inputs, they can either agree or we can have green choosing zero and red choosing one. Now is this decision task solvable? Let's have a look at the input complex. It's the same. We have two nodes and two inputs, so four possibilities represented by square. Now, but interestingly, the output complex is now different because we now have an extra simplex map um, from one, red one to green zero because that is now a possible output. And with this new simplex, red zero, green, green one on the right is now connected. And in fact, we can find the required subdivision and the required simplicial map that will fit the delta requirements. And by the asynchronous computability theorem, the quasi-consensus problem is solvable. 
What is even more exciting is that the whole marriage between topology and distributed systems does not end here. There's a long line of exciting developments regarding this research area. And specifically, I want to talk about two points. The first is that um, if you recall the two generals problem from distributed systems, you can actually use the same argument that I've just presented to prove that the two generals problem is unsolvable. Now, I'm not going to pro provide the proof here. I'll leave it as an exercise for you guys. But you can, you can actually very easily see why the, um, a similar argument would follow. So you, all you have to do is think about what the IO delta tuple is for the two generals problem, and you can see why, by the asynchronous computability theorem, the two generals problem is unsolvable. The second interesting thing I want to point out is that, interestingly, the two operations could actually infer certain properties of the complexity of the protocol required to solve the decision task. Specifically, in 1997, two computer scientists showed that the number of a certain kind of simplexes in the subdivision complex is actually directly proportional to the time complexity of the protocol required to solve the decision task. And I find this very, very exciting and interesting. If there's anything to take away from this talk, it would be these three things. Firstly, I want you to appreciate this really neat relationship between distributed systems and topology. In particular, a protocol for an asynchronous weight-free model could be neatly represented by a simplicial map from the subdivision of the input complex to the output complex such that it fits certain delta properties. The second takeaway from this talk is that I want you to understand why the binary consensus problem is unsolvable. And in particular, we are unable to find the required subdivision and simplicial map that would break the connectivity property that, um, of the two complexes. And lastly, I would argue to be the most important takeaway from this talk is that I hope that this talk could serve as inspiration of how one could use very abstract and weird mathematics and use it in very creative and wonderful ways in computer science. And in particular, introducing the perspective of topology into the world of distributed and concurrent computation. With that, I thank you all for listening. I look forward to people winning the Gerdo Prize in a few years, and I hope that most of you don't find this talk too complex. And thank you all. <laughs>